are watching Darasa Online. Hello, welcome to Darasa Online. My name is Mr. Kileo Abubakar Davidson. I am a geography teacher. Uh, today we are going to learn or to discuss uh, on water masses and we'll focus on what we call underground or groundwater as each subtopic. So let's see, um, because we are going to make a revision, so I'm going to make a simple introduction or simple summary of what you have learned at your school. So um, what is groundwater, by the way? Uh, groundwater refers to the amount of water that has saturated the rock underground. We refer to the amount of water that are uh, found below the acid surface. Or sometimes we say underground water or groundwater refer to the amount of water uh, uh, found below the water table. Are we together? So what happened? It means, uh, <coughs> let's assume we have, this is a ground. See, it means right here we are talking, this is above the ground. Above the what? Above the ground. So if this is above the ground, it means we have the underground right here. We have rock found underground. So it means, for instance, during rainfall, it means there will be the, either the infiltration or the percolation of water underground. Then water will move down the crust, inside the crust. It will find different rocks right here. So some of the rocks uh, will have, uh, uh, can be made of, of what we call the empty space. Right now, water that will enter the ground or into the ground or the underground will saturate. Will, will, will occupy the space between the, the, the rock particles. Are we together? Then the amount of water that are within the space inside the rock particle are what we call the underground water. That's why we said underground water refer to the amount of water underground, refer to the amount of water below the acid surface. As you can see, this is the acid surface. Then the water that is found below the acid surface, that's what we call the underground water. In a very simple way, you can say, refer to the amount of water that has saturated the rock inside the earth. Are we together? Uh, then from there, we said, um, <coughs> that's the definition of what we call the underground water. Then from there, we say, uh, water gets into the ground. Water gets into the ground passes two processes, you see? When water gets into the ground, they normally pass two processes. We have what we call the infiltration, and we have what we call the percolation. These are two processes uh, which water undergo or passes as it is flow down the earth, inside the ground. So the first process we call the infiltration, infiltration. In the second process, we call it the, the percolation. So, what is infiltration? Infiltration, we refer to the downward movement of water underground, but near uh, the surface level. It means right now we are talking about the movement of water inside the rocks underground, but they found nearby the surface level. Are we together? It means, let's assume, let's say, this it is our ground. It means the, there is the movement of water uh, underground but near the surface level as you can see that is what we call the infiltration but uh coming to percolation percolation will refer to the further movement of water underground deep into the interior either vertically or horizontally are we together uh let us assume there is a further movement of water underground deep into the interior either vertically or horizontally we say vertically or horizontally because sometimes water from the sea they may percolate in land from the sea into, into the land right to, I mean, at this point right here. This is the lateral movement of water, far away from where they have been, I mean from the starting point. It may be a sea, lake or whatever, I mean any source of water, uh, water bodies. Or sometimes it may, it may be a vertical, as you can see the vertical movement of water deep into the interior. So uh, by making a uh, the difference between uh, infiltration and percolation, we all know they are all processes where water used to enter the what? The ground. But this one, the infiltration right now, it means that it is a movement of water underground, but it not deep. It means water right now will be found nearby the surface level. While the percolation, it is the opposite of, what? of infiltration. It means right now we are talking about either the lateral or the vertical movement of water underground deep into, into the interior. Then from there, we said, um, <coughs> 
water gets into the ground passing two type of rock. When water gets into the ground, they pass two type of rocks. When, when water gets into the ground, see, into the ground, they passes two types of rocks. Listen to me very careful. When the water gets into the ground, you see, they passes two type of rock. We have what calls the porous rocks, porous rocks, as well as the pervers rocks, pervers rocks. Porous rocks, these are the rocks made up of empty space, like the sandy stones. Are we together? It means sometimes, I mean, in this uh, process or in these rocks, it means water use the empty space between the sandy stones to enter into the ground. See? And those type of rocks, we call them the pause rock. Example of pause rock is sandy stones. Uh, this point, the example of pause rock is what? Is a sandy stone. Then from there, we have the pervers rocks. It means these are the rocks made up of empty, I mean, um, creek or joints. So it means right now water will use the cracks or joint found in these rocks to enter into the ground. Then we say we have the pause rocks as well as the pervers rocks. Pervers rocks are the rocks made up of what? Of the joints or cracks. So it means in this type of rocks, it means water use either cracks or joint to enter the ground. Are we together? Then from there in pause rocks, it means these are the rocks made up of empty space. Empty spaces, we call them pores. Are we together? It means example of porous rocks are sandy stones rocks. Then from there, are, we have what we call, let's see, some terminologies that I'm sure we may found them uh, when learning what to call the underground water. We have some terminology which are very important. The first terminology is what we call the, the water table water table water table water table refer to the upper limit of or upper level of water underground listen to me very careful water table refer to the upper limit or upper level of water underground the upper limit upper limit or upper level of water underground okay the upper limit or Upper level of water underground, we call it the water table. Okay, let's, uh, let us, me draw this so I can understand. Let us take this as an example right here. You see? We know that uh, when water enters the ground, it passes different type of rocks. Are we together? When water into the ground from the above, into the ground, it passes different type of, of water of rocks. So let's say there is a rainfall right here at the top of this land. Then it means right now we are talking about the movement of water underground. So, uh, water will move to the point where sometimes it may found the hard rock, this one, which will prevent the further movement of water underground. It means this hard rock underground will prevent the further movement of water underground, this one. We call it the aquiclody. Aquiclody. So, what is aquiclody? We refer to the further, I mean, the hard rock, which do not allow the further movement of water underground. Therefore, it means water right now will start accumulating at the rock above the quick load. Are we together? It means so right now we are showing this rock right here is where uh, water will accumulate. We are talking about maybe sand or it got empty spaces as I've explained earlier. And the, these rocks, which now will hold it, amount of water underground we call it is the aquifer aquifer this one the aquifer it means aquifer refer to the soft rock this one the rocks made up of empty space where water right now will saturate or will be contained inside it we call it the aquifer then so let's say water have been um uh, contained in these rocks the aquifer and right now we found that this point here, the upper level of water underground, this it is upper level of water underground, this is what we call the water table. Water table. That's why we say water table refer to the uh, upper level 
or upper limit of water underground. Water has been increasing from the bottom point or limit to this upper level right here. Are we together? So the upper level of water underground is what called the water table. The rock which uh, get saturated and contain amount of water underground, we call it the aquifer. Uh, the aquiclud or the aquita, we refer to the hard rock, which do not allow further movement of water underground. Are we together? So we said aquiclud sometimes can be called the aquitad. Aquitad. Are we together, student? Aquiclud sometimes can be called aquitad if a quick clue that we are talking about right now will be made up of clay rock after get wet and it become dry. Once it become dry, it means it turned into a very hard rock. Are we together? So in that point, it means we are talking about this rock which will not allow further movement of water underground. Right now, uh, we call it a quick clue, but we will call it the quick acquitted if will be made up of clay rock after get wet and become dry. So these are the, uh, the very important uh, terms when you're studying underground water. Then uh, go back to aquifer. We have two types of aquifer. Listen to me very careful. We have the confined and the non or unconfined aquifer. The non-confined aquifer, we refer to the aquifer uh, overlain by two impermeable rocks. Are we together? We call it the confined aquifer. But the non-confined aquifer refer to the aquifer which is overlain by one is impermeable, the hard rock, and the other is permeable, the soft rock. This aquifer we call it the unconfined or the non-confined aquifer. But if you find the aquifer overlain by hard rock as well as the hard rock at the top, it means at the bottom there is hard rock and at the top there is hard rock. It means it is between two hard rock. We call it the confide aquifer. Confide aquifer. So uh, we have two types of aquifer. Types of aquifer. Type of aquifer. We have the con confide aquifer uh, and the non confide aquifer okay confide aquifer and the non confide what aquifer so as i said confide aquifer refer to the aquifer overlain by two impermeable or hard rocks then non confide aquifer it means at the top is overlain by what we call the uh, the permeable rocks or the soft rock and at the bottom there is uh, the hard rock then from there um, we have what we call the zones of saturation zone of saturation okay are we together zone of saturation zones of the saturation zones we refer to the layers it means right now we are talking about different layer uh, underground where water passes as it move or as it flow into the ground different layers where water passes as it move or as it goes underground we refer them to as what zone of saturation so we have three type of zone of saturation. We have the what you call the zone of non saturation. See? Zone of what? Of non saturation. Then we have zone of intermittent intermittent saturation. This is the second type of zone of saturation. Non saturation zone of intermittent saturation and zones of permanent saturation permanent what permanent saturation it means what happened to to this zone of saturation as i said zone of saturation refer to the layers where water passes as it goes or as it flows underground it means the first one uh, zone of non-saturation refers to the layers where water passes as it goes underground and then it becomes dry. It got wet when water passes into the ground. After that, it becomes dry. That's all why we call it zone of non-saturation. Why? Because it does not get saturated. As I said earlier, uh, the meaning of saturated, it means the rock, it gets wet and then it contains the amount of water. So right now we are talking about, about the zone of non-saturation. It means it is the zone where water just passes as it flows underground, it gets wet and then it becomes dry. Then we go to the zone of intermittent saturation. It means it is the zone which gets wet during the wet season or, or during the rain season and it becomes dry during the dry season. So it means 
right now in this zone is a zone where we will get the underground water only in wet season. It means in dry season we will not be able to get the underground water. Then we have the zone of permanent saturation. As I said, refer to the zone where uh, it is get saturated in all period or season of the year. Then at this point uh, of zone of permanent saturation, it's where we get what we call the underground water, right here. Here at this point is what we go, what we call what? We get what we call the underground water. And in other way, it's the point where we can, we can call it the aquifer. This point is the aqui, aquifer. Are we together, class? Then from there, um, <coughs> we will see the sample question um, regarding our uh, today's topics, I mean subtopics. And it, remember, it's a very important question because there are sample questions asked in a competent way. Let's see a simple diagram explaining uh, some features of underground water. As I, as I explained earlier, we have what to call the water table. As I've said, uh, as you can see in this diagram, we have assumed this is our aquifer. Right now it contains some amount of water. Then I said the upper level of water inside the ground or underground, this water, I mean this level right here, we call it the water table. It means water has saturated the rock from the below. Right here we have what we call the aquitad or the quick load, the hard rock which will not allow further movement of water underground. Then water will start to um, saturate the rocks above it and we call it the aquifer. So as it saturates, remember it saturates by going up. So the upper level of water inside the rock, this point here, we call it the water table. And remember, if you want to dig or to tap water underground by using well, it means you have to find what we call the water table, or they always find what we call, I mean, what they call the water table. Because remember, they may, uh, they may dig this point here to tap water underground uh, by constructing what we call the well. So in order to have the well, it means you have first to find what we call the, the water table. Then we have um, another diagram. Uh, I explained something known as aquifer. I told you aquifer referred to the layer or our rocks underground which saturate water and contain the underground water, we call it the aquifer. So I explained two types of aquifer earlier, that we have the con unconfined aquifer as well as the confined aquifer, as you can see right here. So uh, confined aquifer, as I said, refer to the aquifer which is overlain by two hard rock. Are we together? Then unconfined aquifer refer to the aquifer overlain by the hard rock and the soft rock. As you can see right here, we have the soft rock, and this one is the aquifer, this is the hard rock. So the, I mean the aquifer overlain by two, rocks one is soft rock and the other is hard rock this type of aquifer which we call it non or unconfined aquifer uh, then from there let's see another diagram so that i can explain uh, more some of these features for instance uh, when you look carefully in this diagram you'll see unconfined aquifer as i've explained we have the hard rock this one this it is a hard rock it means we have the aquifer right here and another aquifer right here so this is hard rock and this is hard rock. So the aquifer overlain by two hard rock, we call it the confined aquifer. While at the top we have unconfined aquifer. Why? Because we have the hard rock and the soft rock right here. So the aquifer which was overlain by soft and hard rock, we call it the unconfined aquifer. Okay, so let's see some of the sample questions uh, concerning the, our topic today. I mean, concerning the today's topic, which is uh, water masses and the subtopic is underground water. Okay, uh, let's see the model question relating to ground or underground water. Um, with, the, with the aid of diagrams, explains the processes involved in hydrological cycle and its link to underground water. So as a Form 6 student, because right now we are making revision, I know you know what is hydrological cycle. And uh, right now I have given you uh, the simple summary of what is underground water. So, uh, it's very important to describe the processes involved in a hydrological cycle. And at the end, we have to link the whole system of the hydrological cycle or water cycle uh, with what? 
with as an underground water. So let's see what is the hydrological cycle. Uh, as you know, hydrological cycle refers to the continual or the endless process where there is uh, movement of water from the ground into the atos atmosphere, then from the atmosphere into the ground. So we call it the continual process of water circulating. It's an endless. Why? Because we know right now uh, this is the land surface. Then we have the atmosphere right there. It means there is the movement of water from the ground, either from the tree, from the land, or from the water. Water bodies. It means right now there is the movement of water from this point into the atmosphere, then from the atmosphere into the ground, etc., etc. So uh, the question asked to describe the process involved in hydrological cycle. So we have, I mean, processes. The question need to explain processes involved in water cycle or hydro, hydro what hydrological. Circle. So the first process you can see there is evaporation. We have evaporation, we have transpiration in the combining process which we call it the evapotranspiration. Then we have the condensation and the last we have what we call the, the precipitation. So let's say what is evaporation. Evaporation is the first process. Evaporation refers to the loss of water from the ground into into the atmosphere the loss of water from the ground into the atmosphere uh, most of the time evaporation it occur in area where with water bodies as you can see right here there is evaporation the loss of water from the ground into what into the atmosphere we call it the the evaporation transpiration refers to the loss of water from the vegetations you see the loss of water from the vegetation into the atmosphere we call it what the transpiration it means this is the second what the second process in hydrological cycle, transpiration. It means this loss of water from the land into, into the atmosphere. That is what you call the, the evaporation. While the transpiration, it means it is the loss of water from, from the vegetation. Into, into the atmosphere. Then from there we have the combining process in case maybe you have the land which is moist as well as the land is um, characterized by different type of vegetation. It means we have the combining process of evaporation and transpiration. Then we call it the evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration. It means this it is the third process. Evapotranspiration refers to the combining process of trans, I mean evaporation is what? And uh, transpiration. Then from there we have the condensation. Condensation. What is condensation? Remember, what is condensation? It means condensation refers to the process where the water vapor, um, the water vapor which has been uh, lost from the, from the ground into the atmosphere right now is changed into into the water droplets or the liquid droplets. Condensation, it means right now the water vapor, water vapor is now changed, changed into, into water droplets. Water droplets, which right now hang at the, at the atmosphere at this point. That's another process. So what happened, it means if there will be more cooling at the atmosphere, either due to advection or other processes, uh, for instance, the, what we call the frontal, it means there will be the increase in weight of the what? Of the water droplets which hang at the, at the atmosphere. So the increase in weight of the water droplets which hang or suspended at the atmosphere will cause the falling down of the water droplets. Why? Because the atmosphere will fail to hold the liquid drops. Why? Because there are ease increase in the mass of the water droplets. Then the falling down of the water droplets from the atmosphere into the ground is what we call the precipitation. So precipitation can be in form of either uh, ice or uh, water droplets. Those are the five processes of hydrological or water cycle as the question needs. But at the end, the question needs us to link and link and its link, explain or describe its link to underground water. So what hap happened, as I said earlier, that uh, underground water refers to the amount of water underground. So 
the question it's very simple because right now it needs us to, to explain the link between the water circle or the hydrological circle and what you call the, the underground water. So listen to me very careful. What happened right now, uh, it's like we are explaining one among the factors which affect the amount of groundwater is the climate. And uh, in climate, it means we are talking about the rainfall. We, uh, we all know that uh, area with little or no rainfall, there are, it, it assume or it, it will determine the very little amount of water underground. Why? Because we expect most of the area with high rainfall, they expect to have high amount of, uh, high amount of uh, water underground due to high rate of infiltration and what? And percolation. So it means how are you going to answer your question? You will explain the whole process of hydrological circles as well as the factors affecting the hydrological circle. And later in your conclusion, you link uh, by explaining what is underground water, type of underground water, and how do rain for especially link it to what? To the amount of, of ground water uh, is ex ex explained earlier. So that's the way you are supposed to answer this question. Then from there, um, we have to see the another questions. I mean, the second question uh, related to our Mm, subtopic today, uh, which is groundwater. We have another question, or the second question, which said account for six factors which influence infiltration and the percolation of underground water in the world. Six factors which influence infiltration and the percolation of underground water in the world. So in general, it means it needs us to explain factors which influence the rate of infiltration and the percolation of water underground. So as I explained earlier, uh, it means uh, how are you going to answer this question? In your introduction, in your introduction, you have to explain what is underground water. You have to explain what is underground water. Are you together? In your introduction, you have to explain what is underground water. And second, you explain that uh, water get into the ground passing two processes, infiltration and percolation. So you have to tell them what is infiltration. Infiltration as well, what, as well as what is percolation. Thereafter, uh, you have to explain factors which influence the rate of infiltration and percolation. Uh, as a result, at the end, you get high amount of, of underground water within the rocks particles. I mean, within the rocks underground. Okay, uh, let's see uh, six factors which affect the, or which influence the inflation percolation of underground water. So the first factor is factors influence the rate of infiltration, infiltration and percolation of underground water. So factor influencing the rate of percolation and infiltration of underground water. Uh, <coughs> before explaining the factors, uh, let me explain type of underground water. So through type we understand the, we'll be able to explain the the, the factor influence the rate of infiltration and, and the percolation. We have type of ground or underground water. Type of ground or underground water. underground water. Uh, the first one is meteoric meteoric ground water. Then we have the cornet ground water then we have the juvenile juvenile or sometimes they call magmatic ground water and the last one is oceanic ground water as you can see we have uh, four type of ground water we have the meteoric groundwater, the cornet groundwater, the juvenile or the magmatic groundwater, as well as the oceanic groundwater. So uh, these are all the origins of groundwater. It means meteoric groundwater are referred to the amount of uh, underground water which is derived or originated from rainfall. It means the meteoric, <coughs> it is derived or originated from what? 
from rainfall. So it depends on the amount of rainfall of a given area. It means if the area is, uh, is, com is com com comprised of high rainfall in terms of its climatic condition, it means we expect high amount of groundwater. Then uh, conate groundwater, we say, refer to the small, small amount of water underground retained uh, in the sedimentary rocks during the time of its formation. Remember, uh, when there is formation of sedimentary rocks, there was a deposition of different material which later lithified together, compacted uh, underground for many, many years under great heat and pressure, they may turn into rock. So one among the products that will be formed there is what we call the underground water. The, that's why we say the small amount of water underground retained during the formation of sedimentary rocks. The amount of water which you retained uh, underground during the formation of sedimentary rocks, we call it the conate underground or conate groundwater. Then we have the juvenile or the magmatic groundwater. It means refer to the amount of water underground uh, formed or occurred during the igneous or the volcanic activity. So what happened to this point is most of the juvenile or magmatic groundwater, they are usually mineralized and hot. They are usually mineralized and hot. So uh, they may be formed to um, I mean, uh, events or phenomena, what we call it geysers. Geysers or hot, what? hot spring. If the hydrostatic uh, pressure inside it or inside the underground water will be of high, high force. Then from there we have the oceanic groundwater. The oceanic groundwater it means we refer to the amount of groundwater originated from the sea or oceans. Most of this groundwater are saltier, are saltier water. Uh, then from there, let's see the factor which influences the rate of infiltration and percolation of, of underground water. So the factor is the question needed because the question right now it needs us to explain the factor which influences the rate of infiltration and percolation. So the first factor is the nature, it depends on the nature of the surface rock. Nature of the surface rock. You see, remember right now, for instance, if there is rainfall, you see, if there is rainfall, then we expect this is the ground. Then if at the top right here, the nature of the rock is very hard, the resistance rock. If this point here will be made up of resistance rock, then we expect there will be very little infiltration or percolation of water underground. So at the end, we expect or we will get the small amount of water underground. Why? Because there is a very little infiltration in the percolation of water underground due to the presence of a very hard rock at the surface of the land. Is its opposite is that uh, when the surface, I mean the surface uh, at this point. Uh, at the top of the land is made up of soft rock, then we expect a high rate of infiltration and percolation, where later will result to the high amount of water underground. This it is the first point. Then we go to the second point. The second point can be gradient, gradient or slope. So uh, they said it depends if the area is like this. See, this is steep slope. This is gentle slope. This is gentle slope. So remember, at the steep slope, there is high, there is fast flowing of water down a slope. It means at this at this point there is a little infiltration percolation rate. Why at the gentle slope there is slow movement of water down a slope? It means if there is a slow movement of water down a slope, then at this point we expect high rate of infiltration and percolation. Then most of the area found in gentle slope, we expect high amount of water underground compared to the area of what? Of steep slope. We call it, that's another, fa I mean that it is what we call or referred it as slope or the gradient. Then from there, uh, we have another factor known as climate. 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 So let us talk in terms of temperature and rainfall. You see, uh, area of high temperature, 
area of high temperature in terms of hot, it means there will be little amount of water underground. Why? Because there will be high rate of evaporation or transpiration. Then most of water which are underground will be taken into, into the atmosphere. But we expect area of low or little temperature, it means area of cold or cool areas. Here we're talking about the hot areas. Here we are talking about the cool areas. Most of the cool areas we expect to be uh, to have high amount of water underground. Why? Because at this point there will be little evaporation and transpiration rate. Then you go to the rainfall. It's easy. Uh, we know that area of high rainfall, high rainfall. Then we expect at this point there will be uh, what we call high amount of water underground. While area with little or no rainfall. Here will be there will be small amount of water underground. You see, this is rainfall. Then from there we have what we call the vegetation. Vegetations. It means let's take an example of forest. Forest. So vegetation, it has the direct and indirect effect on underground water. Let's see the direct effect first. The direct effect. It means we know vegetation, it influences rainfall. It influences rainfall. See, areas uh, of dense forest, there is uh, normally high rainfall due to what? Due to high rate of evaporation and transpiration. Then at this point, we, if there will be high amount of rainfall, then we expect high rate of infiltration and percolation. Later, we will get what we call high amount of underground water. Apart from influencing rainfall, uh, remember in area of forest, there is shadow. There is presence of shadow. So the presence of shadow uh, in forest areas, it means it prevents evaporation, the rate of evapotranspiration. See, so if there will be uh, less rate of evapotranspiration, it means at this point there will be high amount of water into I mean, underground. Then you come to indirect effect. Indirect effect. Indirect effect, it means <coughs> sometimes vegetation may reduce the amount of water underground. How? We know vegetations are living things. Say you, they use the water which are inside the ground. So they decrease. Decrease amount of water underground. Why? Because vegetation, as I said, are living things. So they use water for photosynthesis process. Uh, this is indirect effect. But also vegetation, they may increase, they may increase amount of water underground. Why? Because remember, uh, the place where uh, increased water underground by providing, by providing a place where water may enter or soak into the ground, especially at the stem. You see, at the point where there is a stem in the, in the ground right here, you see? At this point, is, there is a place of weakness. So if there was a flowing of water, it means water may enter the ground through this point here. Are we together? Then we say we have the direct and the indirect effect uh, which influences the rate of uh, groundwater through vegetation. Then from there, uh, we have the type. It depends on the type of soil. It depends on the type of soil. Type of soil. So right now we are talking about what we call the, it depends on the amount of empty space within the soil bodies. Some of the, of the soils they are made up of more spaces or pores. See, we are talking about the empty space between the soil particle, empty spaces between the soily soil particles. So, if the soil is made up of more empty spaces, it means it allow, I mean, there will be high rate of what? Of infiltration and percolation of water underground. Then we expect high amount of water underground at the end. But if the soil will be made of very few space, it means no pores at all. It means we expect no 
or there will be very little amount, I mean, rate of fault in filtration percolation, where at the end we will get a uh, low amount of water underground. The last point is, the last point is what to call water bodies, presence of water bodies. The presence of water bodies. Water bodies. It means right here, the amount of infiltration or percolation, remember it influences the rate of, or the amount of water underground or into the ground. So the point is, most of the area which are located nearby water bodies, we expect high rate of infiltration percolation, which will lead to the high rate of water or amount of water underground. But areas which are located far away from water bodies, then we expect little uh, rate of infiltration percolation, which will lead to small or low rate of water underground. So these are the factors which influence the rate of what? Infiltration percolation, which at the end will affect the amount of water underground in general, as I've explained earlier. So by concluding um, or giving you a quiz, I'm going to leave you with a quiz uh, that you will do it uh, because I know right now you are listening and you are at home. You can take it as a quiz. Uh, explain. Explain factors affecting the types of fretic water. Fretic what? Fretic water. This is the first question. The second question is explain condition necessary for the formation formation of an attention well attention well please go and read this and i need the answers please listen to me very careful these are very important question especially in water masses see uh, relating to underground water explain factors affecting the type of fretic water fretic water is another uh, name for underground water. So go and explain factors affecting what types of underground water. Thereafter, I need you to explain condition necessary for the formation of what we call the attention well. Then thank you very much. Uh, until the next time, thank you. You are most welcome. <laughs>